Okay, so uh, before I start this, I do want to give uh, some trigger warnings. I will be discussing a number of types of violence, including sexual violence and incest, and also a trigger warning for the fact that uh, Welsh is not one of the languages I speak, so I will probably be doing some uh, butchering of pronunciations, and I can only ask that you forgive me. All right, so on with the talk. The fall of the House of Camelot, Arthurian Gothic. So. In 1816, the year without a summer, there were several important uh, literary works that uh, came out, or at least were started. Mary Shelley famously wrote Frankenstein, a fundamental work in Gothic Romanticism, also sometimes considered the first science fiction novel. At the same party where she wrote Frankenstein, uh, Dr. John Polidori wrote The Vampire, which would become the first, uh, or at least the first mainstream popular depiction of the aristocratic vampire, which would lead to things like Carmilla and Dracula. And also for the first time since the 1400s, there was a new edition of Mort d'Artour, Thomas Mallory's uh, famous work about King Arthur and his knights. Now, Mallory was not the inventor of the Arthur stories, just like Shelley and Polidori were not the inventors of the Gothic novel but all three of them popularized things beyond anything that had come before. And uh, in what, would, uh, what was then the Regency and would become the Victorian era, that was the perfect time for all these works to flourish. Now, I'm going to start with a little background about the King Arthur stories. The first stories would have been stuff from the oral tradition. And so it's a little hard to track those down. Of the things that were published, the first that we know of so far is in 1136, Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, which was, well, as it title indicates, a somewhat historical work, uh, talked about, among other things, uh, King Arthur. Now, the story in that one is presented as uh, King Uther Pendragon, uh, Pendragon not being so much an, a last name as an appellation honoring him, Dragon's Head. Uh, fell for the wife Igerna of the Duke of Cornwall. She was a faithful wife and would not sleep with him, so he asked the great magician Merlin to change him into the form of her husband so that he could sleep with her. And from that union was born Arthur. Arthur would eventually rise to be a great king who had beat back the Saxon invaders. However, he was ultimately betrayed. His wife had affair with his nephew, just his nephew in this iteration, Mordred, and they plotted to seize the crown. This all culminated in a battle at Camlan where both Arthur and Mordred fell. And then a woman who is known as the he great healer, Morgan, came to Arthur's dying side. And uh, she said that she, the only way she could heal him is if she took him back to Avalon, the Isle of Apples, to heal him. And she did. And there he either died and she buried him or she healed him and he lives still. And then after that, all of the work that Arthur had done to protect the island from the Saxons fell apart and uh, until eventually glory was restored by the noble Normans who were of course Joffrey of Monmouth's uh, audience. This is probably a good time for me to mention that when I talk about Arthur as the king of the Britons, that's Britain with an O. It's an ethnic group uh, that would Eventually, once the Saxons invaded, intermarry enough so that it, you can't really separate the two anymore. Um, and so when I say Britain, I don't just mean England. I also mean basically anywhere the Britons lived, especially Wales. Speaking of which, the and this is one of the things I'm probably going to mispronounce, the Mabinogia, which is a great compendium of Welsh folklore, and it is not entirely about Arthur, but there is a famous Arthurian story. As you can see, this was published uh, between 1350 and 1410, but it was a collection of earlier stories. The Arthurian interlude is called, and again, I'm doing my best to pronounce it, Kiluch and Olwen. Uh, Kiluch is a brave young knight who wants to marry Olwen, the beautiful daughter of an evil giant. He goes to Arthur's court to ask for help. Um, amusingly, Arthur says that he will grant him any boon except his personal weapons, his animals, or his life. This is uh, amusing because elsewhere in the Mabinogion, in the story of Rhiannon, um, a uh, king promises a boon to a stranger who asks his wife and he's for his wife, and he's honor bound to do it. I, it's sort of meta, as if Arthur has heard that story and he's prepared not to make that mistake. 
uh, they uh, they go off to defeat the giant by means of accomplishing a series of impossible tasks. And most importantly, you meet the knights of Arthur's court. And here they are portrayed kind of as like Marvel superheroes crossed with sort of American lumberjack tall tales like Paul Bunyan. There's one who can grow to enormous sizes. There's one who can run at the speed of thought. There's one who has a dagger who can lay across the uh, as a bridge and it will become huge. Uh, amusingly, Bedivere's uh, magical power is that he's just really good looking. Uh, and Sir Kay, who some of you might know from uh, Disney's Sword in the Stone as a mean bully, is uh, in this story, he has power over heat and flame and any wound he inflicts will not heal. This is sort of uh, the setup for a future tradition in which Arthur would be less the protagonist and more the connecting feature around which a bunch of sort of more interesting knights would rally. So next, another important question I feel for me to answer is, was Arthur real? And the answer is maybe. Again, as with anything that originates in the oral story trailing tradition, it's hard to pinpoint these things. There were people who fought against the invading Saxons. Uh, there were warlords. One of them could have been Arthur. There are some historical characters from the era, such as Ambrosius, whose names kind of sound like Arthur, if you squint. Um, it's worth noting that this uh, interest in whether Arthur really existed is somewhat modern. When uh, Joffrey of Monmouth wrote History of the Kings of Britain, he felt free to make up whatever he wanted, and he wasn't lying. This was just how you told historical stories at the time. Uh, the Tudors did claim to be descended from Arthur, but they were certainly not interested in unearthing you know, Roman era archeological sites. Uh, basically, if Arthur existed as sort of a Roman Celtic warlord, he would not be the Arthur that we know insofar as so many authors have added different things to him that he's become fully a different character. And I like this quote from John Steinbeck who began but never finished an attempt to retell Mort d'Artour, which is, so many scholars have spent so much time trying to establish whether Arthur existed at all that they have lost track of the single truth that he exists over and over. So what are the canonical Arthurian texts? Well, there's a lot of them. What I like to say is the problem with King Arthur stories is that there's too much canon. And the problem with Robin Hood stories is that there's no canon. Um, of the stuff that is considered fundamental, Mort d'Artour is not the best written. It's not my favorite, but it became the definitive work because it was written in English. And it, it doesn't just tell a couple stories about the knights. It tells Arthur's whole story from birth to death. Uh, other sources that are important, um, one of my favorite characters, Gawain, is a favorite because he always gets the weird sort of surrealist adventures, um, including The Green Knight, which I will be talking about later, The Carl of Carlisle, which is sort of a horror comedy story where he has to perform bizarre requests while staying at the house of an ogre, and The Wedding of Sir Gawain and Dan Ragnell, a very uh, nice variation on the lovely lady story where he breaks a curse by giving his wife autonomy in her decisions, which, you know, nice moral. Uh, Christiane de Troy, writing a bunch of Arthurian romances, is the one who introduced the character of Lancelot in Knight of the Cart, uh, as well as Yvain, sort of a tragicomic figure in Knight of the Lion, and Parsifal, which would become Percival, a very early Grail Quest story. Uh, Percival is sort of a bumbling, but a uh, very well-intentioned uh, sort of feral child who goes on, uh, he wants to become a knight and then goes questing and has trouble understanding the real world. Uh, Chrétien de Troyes never finished that story. And so others have attempted to uh, finish it. Most famously, uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach wrote, uh, finished Percival. And uh, I should mention, uh, these would become a larger part of the Grail Quest stories. I'm not gonna be focusing on that so much, but it's worth mentioning that among the knights uh, said to have seen the Grail, Lancelot got to see it, but uh, didn't get to touch it because of his adultery. Uh, Galahad, Percival, Bors, and in a weird German work that is one of my favorites, uh, Dean Crone, Gawain achieved the Grail. Uh, and of course, let us not forget Indiana Jones. Um, now, speaking of Percival, this is, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Perilous Faust because it, it kind of sets the scene for the weird ways people will be interpreting Arthurian literature based on their time and context. 
Wikipedia calls this quote, the least canonical text, canonical, uh, because it had a very small influence on anything else. It is a continuation of Percival's story and it is incredibly ludicrously violent. Uh, decapitations, especially, there's a decapitation in practically every chapter. Um, the story goes all over the place. The most famous interlude in it from people who know about it is one where uh, Arthur and Guinevere have a child named Loholt. Loholt defeats a giant and then the text actually says that he had a strange custom whereby when he killed an enemy, he would sleep on top of his body. Uh, so he does that. Sir Kay uh, is jealous and kills Loholt in his sleep so that he can claim uh, the reward for killing the giant. Eventually this treachery is uncovered and Guinevere dies of grief. Uh, Percival does finally achieve the grail though, so uh, that's something. One of the most interesting things about this is it does appear to have been written by a crusader, and so there have been theories that this author was working through his PTSD, especially possibly relating to uh, witnessing or causing decapitations. So, now, uh, if I was going to tell you the whole story of everything to do with King Arthur, I would be here for the foreseeable future. So instead, I want to focus on some Arthurian protagonists and talk about their Gothic journeys, as you will, sort of a bunch of little self-contained uh, Gothic novellas. And to do that, we want to start with the person who kicks it all off, Merlin. Now, Merlin uh, might also have been a real person. He was based on stories about a Celtic bard who could tell the future called Mird in the Wild. Uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth seems to have been the first person to graft him onto the story of King Arthur, but he became so famous that uh, by the time Mallory wrote Mort d'Artour, he just said uh, Uther called upon Merlin, didn't even bother to explain who Merlin was. Even works today that don't use magic often have Merlin as a sort of da Vinci type figure uh, helping Arthur. But Merlin had uh, came to have a bit of a dark side to him, especially regarding his birth, which is the story I want to tell here. Robert de Boron wrote uh, a prose poem that would become the standard telling of, uh, of Merlin's birth. Um, and it starts with a bunch of demons talking to each other, saying now that Jesus has come to earth, people are being redeemed, people are listening to his prophecies. This is very bad for hell, what are we going to do? And so uh, the demons uh, decide what we need is a false prophet to lead people away from the light. As you can see here, if we could have such a man who would converse with the people of earth and help us greatly to deceive men and women alike, just as the prophets worked against us when we have them here, then they said it would be a great deed to create such a man, for they would all believe in him. They find a demon who is able to have sex, and then they set about a reign of terror upon a merchant's family. Uh, they destroy their livelihood by like killing all their crops. Uh, they strangle the young son. Uh, the father dies of grief. The mother who was seduced by the demon into helping him, he then forces to kill herself. Um, the daughters, two of them, he uh, seduces to lives of promiscuity. The third who wouldn't be seduced uh, when she has a bad moment and forgets to make the sign of the cross, he rapes her. Uh, she becomes pregnant and the town wants to kill her for this crime. But a confessor convinces them to allow her to at least live until she's had the baby and the baby has been baptized. Now in the course when she does have Merlin, his baptism throws a real wrench in uh, the demon's plans because it, doesn't entirely negate, but it fights with uh, his demonic birth. The first thing Merlin does after being born is save his mother. He, as an infant, speaks up in her defense, saying she did not do this willingly, and all you townspeople are horrible and sinful and hypocritical. And he goes on to state everyone's worst sins. If any of you have seen the TV show Carnival, uh, what Brother Justin does, it's, it's kind of similar to what Merlin does. Um, and uh, he gets her acquitted, which is very nice. Um, the thing I would want to emphasize about this is that it's a horror story. Most of the time is spelled in the buildup as this family is systematically torn apart and murdered uh, and tortured. And when sort of the final, um, when, uh, when finally what's going on happens, she has her baby and he talks, 
he is a very sort of the omen style creepy child but he's not evil at least not entirely it is stated that because he was born to uh devils he can know everything that happened in the past but because he was baptized and given god's blessing he can know everything that happens in the future and thus uh he it is left to him to decide what his destiny will be now there are great gothic traditions of uh sexual devils the most famous is probably matilda from the monk who seduces ambrosio away from his life of piety into one uh of sin and murder uh there's also in the faust stories usually one of the uh one of the things faust is tempted with is uh getting to have sex with whoever he wants um interestingly uh, faust is itself used as kind of foreshadowing in the book phantom of the opera uh, when it's performed because Christine will become both Faust and Marguerite. She is making a deal with a devilish figure to achieve her skill and she will also be endangered by a devilish man later. More <clears throat> Merlin, what I would posit in addition to all this, uh, to his very sinister matter of birth, you might also think of Good Omens or Hellboy in addition to the Omen or Rosemary's Baby, is that he becomes sort of the first Byronic hero. He is born with a curse, but with the ability to at least strive. Um, he tries to do good in terms of raising Arthur to be the greatest king, but he also does evil in the form of helping with uh, Arthur's conception. And while uh, people in the Middle Ages definitely had different definitions of rape than we do today, it, it was never considered okay for a king to just seize his vassal's life. That is very clearly supposed to be an evil act. And then, of course, Merlin, what ultimately undoes him is lust. He falls, um, he falls for a beautiful series of beautiful pupils of his, first with Morgan, who has no interest in him whatsoever, and then with a lady of the lake who's called either Nimue or Vivian, who uh, traps him in, alive in sto uh, stone or a tree, depending on your take. Merlin, he tried his best. Um, and he, his angelic half brought great uh, peace to the realm, but his devilish half undid him in the end. In a way, he's a metaphor for the human condition. We are caught between heaven and hell and left to navigate these things ourselves. Speaking of magic, on to everyone's favorite character, Morgan Le Fay. Now, you might remember I mentioned when we were talking about history of the kings of Britain, Morgan there is a good guy. She is described as a great healer. Her role is to show up at the end and take Arthur to the island of Avalon. This is not the only place where Morgan is a good guy. She's also a good guy in the Chrétien de Troy stories. When Yvain uh, goes mad in the woods, uh, he is given a potion created by Morgan the Wise, which restores his sanity, sort of a magical form of psychiatric drugs. However, um, she started appearing in more sinister contexts as time went on. I do want to address, it's often said that sort of the pagan writers said Morgan was good and the Christian writers said he, she was evil. That's not true. All of these men were different varieties of Christian, but they all had different views of women and different views of what role in the plot they wanted a powerful sorceress to play. In uh, Mort d'Artour, she is the daughter of, um, the legitimate daughter, of uh, Arthur's mother and her lawful husband. She is sent to a nunnery of all places where she learns magic by reading sort of forbidden books. Throughout the rest of Arthur's reign, she variously seduces his knights and tries to kill him by means of magic tricks and poisons. But she does appear then at the end when he is mortally wounded to help carry him to Avalon where he will either be healed or buried. Now, Morgan, uh, being in a convent, of course, that's a bit reminiscent of Ambrosio, the monk, as well as the various evil canis canonesses in the works of Anne Radcliffe, where nunneries are places where you can find innocent heroines who are struggling to escape. But in her position as sort of ultimate femme fatale, the character that she prefigures most to me is Victoria Loredani in uh, Charlotte Dacre's Zafloya who is a noblewoman who um, doesn't so much fall to evil as pick up a bunch of new hobbies involving uh, black magic. And she uses these to get revenge on people who have slighted her and to capture the love of uh, 
of men she desires who don't return it. Uh, now, Victoria, of course, and Ambrosio in The Monk are both punished for their acts of black magic. Very interestingly, Morgan is not. And she also achieves a kind of redemption in uh, Mort d'Artour. As I said, she appears to help her brother in his final hour of need. In the poetic cycle, The Vulgate, from which uh, Mort d'Artour took a lot, she actually on her own reforms. Arthur meets her in the later chapters and she's become a good person. She's found God and just does her own thing now, which is very cool for her. But I think the thing that interests people the most about Morgan is this push and pull, this anti-hero status. Uh, she's sort of this shocking, scandalous woman, but she's also, albeit unreliable, an ally and a powerful ally. Uh, and again, I think that's that's the most interesting thing about Morgan is she's one of those characters kind of like Baba Yaga in uh, Russian folktales who can be a good guy or a bad guy, depending on the story. So next up, Mordred. Insofar as there is a single villain in Arthurian stories, it is Mordred. He is either uh, either Arthur's nephew uh, or he is Arthur's illegitimate son by his sister Morgaus. Not Morgan, Morgaus. It's confusing, but that's the way they named him. Um, and Mordred is destined to try to seize the throne and destroy everything. And now the next part that I'm going to talk about is Mordred's backstory. Now, this is not his backstory in everything. Uh, it's not in Prechian de Troy, it's not in uh, Tennyson, it's certainly not in Geoffrey of Monmouth, but uh, Mallory and the Vulgate, both of which did not see Arthur so much as the protagonist and were uh, happier to attribute dark deeds to him, tell us the story of the Mayday Massacre. Uh, after he's had a child with, um, with uh, Morgaus, Merlin uh, tells Arthur that a child, a male noble child born on May Day will be uh, the man who kills him. Arthur is not willing to take chances. He has all the noble male babies born on uh, May Day put into a boat and then like Herod or Pharaoh has the boat sunk. Mordred is the sole survivor. He's rescued and this whole horrific bloody deed is for nothing. Now, Mallory never mentions this story ever again, so it's possible this was just sort of an unpleasant interlude. But if you think of this as being fundamental to Mordred's character, it starts to fall more into place. There's this uh, amusing uh, movie called Night Riders with a K that was made by George Romero, and it's about a bunch of hippies who get joust on, um, who joust on motorcycles. And there's a character who calls himself Merlin, played by the storyteller Brother Blue, and he tells the story of the Mayday Massacre, but his specific point at the end is he says, if Arthur hadn't tried to stop it, it might never have happened. So if you take that view that the Mayday Massacre is what creates Mordred rather than the other way around, he falls into the tradition of Heathcliff, Phantom of the Opera and uh, Steerpike from Gormenghast in terms of these Gothic villains who are evil because they've been denied what they think is theirs by birthright. Um, Heathcliff is the illegitimate son of, well, probably implied to be the illegitimate son of uh, Mr. Earnshaw, the man who takes him in. And uh, over the course of being both denied the chance to marry uh, Catherine Earnshaw, who if this theory is correct is his half sister and uh, collect uh, various uh, benefits, he is, he becomes evil he is still understandable, but he becomes incredibly cruel, uh, does horrible things like spousal and child abuse and murdering puppies. I'm not making that up. Um, Phantom of the Opera act outright says his parents rejected him because of how hideous he was born. Uh, if I am the Phantom, it is man's cruelty and hatred which has made me so. Searpike and Gormenghast is a uh, born into a castle where everyone has very rigid social roles. He's in the kitchens, but he doesn't like how badly they treat him there. So he begins a campaign to rise as uh, high as he can and murder is very often involved in that. I think Mordred would, prob Mordred would probably sympathize with, uh, with these motives, even if the, his, the results are bloody because when you are illegitimate, sometimes the only thing to do is to take what you think you are owed by force if it will not be given to you. Moving on, 
Lancelot and Guinevere. Now these have become the iconic lovers of Arthurian stories. But if you read Mort d'Artour or Chrétien de Troyes' Knight of the Cart, it comes across as very unbalanced. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, Monty Python in the Holy Grail, where um, the joke of Lancelot is that he is, incre he is very erratic and will fly into murderous rages at the slightest provocation or suggestion that a maiden needs to be rescued. It's very funny, but it's not actually that far off from how Mallory depicts him. He is basically any time Guinevere rejects him, he goes crazy and runs off into the woods to live uh, as a mad hermit. And this happens multiple times. Um, to, at, when they are, of course, discovered in their adultery, he flips out and he kills many, many of his former friends in sort of a mad fury uh, to protect himself and Guinevere. Guinevere, for her part, um, in these stories comes off as very cold, uh, very uh, unpleasable, and actually a little bit emotionally abusive. I should mention, though, that this is not uh, the writers deciding Guinevere is a bad person. This is a convention of courtly love. The idea of courtly love is you are proving how devoted you are to uh, the woman you love. And it is much more impressive if you are accomplishing impossible tasks for an unpleasable ice queen than it is if you are doing simple favors for a receptive girlfriend. Um, so Lancelot is defined by this sort of mad love that he has for Guinevere. He will do anything for her. Uh, she defines his life. Without him, he, without her, he goes mad. And so I want to quote this bit from The Sorrows of Young Werther by Goethe. Sometimes I don't understand how another can love her, is allowed to love her, since I love her so completely myself, so intensely, so fully, grasp nothing, know nothing, have nothing but her. I possess so much, but my love for her absorbs it all. I possess so much, but without her, I have nothing. Uh, the Sorrow of Zyotin Werther was very popular and supposedly kicked off an epidemic of suicides among romantic young dandies. This probably didn't happen, or at least not to the extent that the myth has become, but the fact that there was a myth indicates how popular the book was and how moving people felt it. Uh, you'll see similar um, you'll see similar things in romantic poetry of people like Keats and Baudelaire, who wrote, I believe, in Fleurs du Mal, of a woman who uh, makes you desire only to be crushed beneath her gaze. Now, when uh, everything is done, final battle is over, Arthur is dead, you might think that Lancelot and Guinevere can finally be together. Of course not. This is, <laughs> this is not the kind of story where sinning lovers uh, get to have their happily ever afters. They have to be cosmically punished. Uh, both of them enter religious orders when Lancelot finds the convent where Guinevere is, um, she tells him, I love you so much, but we between us were the wreck of Camelot and we cannot ever be allowed to see each other again. This also has its uh, descendants in Gothic literature about sinning lovers where at the end they say something similar. I'm thinking here of the Scarlet Letter where uh, as Reverend Dimsdale dies, Hester Prynne, who had an affair with and a child by him, asks him, do you think we'll at least get to see each other in heaven? And he, his dying words are a big speech about how, no, they are too sinful. They will be not denied each other in heaven, should never have committed such a sin to begin with. A far colder example is in uh, Tess of the Durbervilles, where poor Tess, who is more sinned against than sinning, is going to be hanged for murder. Her uh, lover, Angel Claire, comes to her and she says, oh, please promise me that we can at least be together in the afterlife. He, it is said, kisses her to avoid answering her. And she gets the message and says, oh, I fear your answer is no. I should also mention at this point, uh, it's when modern, uh, when modern things do uh, their adaptation, they usually uh, cut down on this. If any of you have seen the movie A Knight's Tale, they actually include a bit from one of the Lancelot and Guinevere stories where uh, the heroine demands that to prove his love for her, the hero uh, lose a joust instead of win it. To the courtly love people, this was very romantic. To viewers of A Knight's Tale, they often complain about how completely unreasonable the heroine is. Uh, one other thing I want to mention um, is, and it's just because it's funny, I mentioned Dio Cronite before. 
and, and there, uh, Guinevere and Lancelot are not having an affair, but another knight, uh, who I believe his name is pronounced Gasolzine, uh, comes and claims that uh, it is him that Guinevere loves and not Arthur. Arthur asks Guinevere which one she'd like to be with, and she chooses Arthur. And no war necessary, but sadly, uh, that is not the case for the way it plays out often. So on to Sir Gawain, again, the, uh, the recipient of the weirdest adventures uh, here. His picture is from the 2014 Arthur movie, which is not great, but fun. And I like how he looks there. And I'm gonna talk about his adventure with the Green Knight, who is over here. That is Sean Connery in the film, Sword of the Valiant. Because he is turned to the side, you cannot see that in his green armor, there is a big cutout section that reveals his midriff and his nipples. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, I wish to God this movie was better because Sean Connery is such good casting for the Green Knight. But anyway, I'll proceed with this story and uh, I guess spoilers in case anyone's hoping to see the Green Knight with Dev Patel movie coming out this summer, which I am, but. Uh, so the Green Knight is sort of a fairy-like figure who shows up on Christmas and demands that someone uh, chop his head off and then in a year and a day, he gets to chop their head off. Gawain ends up taking the bait after it looks like King Arthur is going to have to. Uh, so instead he jumps in, he cuts the Green Knight's head off. The Green Knight picks up his head and says, I'll see you in a year and a day. Gawain is understandably uh, frightened by this, but he gave his word, so he's going, to, he's going to do it. He goes off when the time comes. He is allowed rest and shelter in a castle uh, owned by Lord and Lady Bertilac, who are very welcoming to him. Uh, Lord Bertilac proposes a game where every day uh, Bertilac will go out hunting and give Gawain anything that he, uh, that he hunts, that he finds, and um, Gawain in return will stay in the castle, and anything that he receives he will give to Bertilac. And indeed that very night, uh, Gawain does receive something, which is a visit from Lady Bertilac, who is described as incredibly beautiful. Um, and she comes into his bed, and she tells him, my husband is gone, all the servants are asleep, let's, uh, let's have at it. Gawain says no, after all he is on this quest as a matter of honor, it would completely invalidate this if he went ahead and slept with his host's wife, but she invokes the rules of courtly love to trap him in a situation where it would also be dishonorable if he let her go away crying and disappointed. So he kisses her, uh, but that's it. Then the next morning, he has to give what he received to Lord Bertilac. So Bertilac comes home, gives him some meat and Gawain, as uh, the poem says here translated by Tolkien, of all people. His fair neck he enfolded then fast in his arms and kissed him with all the kindness that courtesy knew. Now homoeroticism is not anything new to uh, medieval or Arthurian works. This variety uh, reminds me though of another story of a man in a castle on a dangerous quest who uh, is approached and attempted to be seduced by the lady of the house but then the Lord of the house comes to claim it instead. This would be Jonathan Harker during his dreadful stay on Castle Dracula. Uh, at this point in the story, he doesn't know that Dracula is a vampire, but has picked up that Dracula intends to kill him and is desperately searching for a way to escape. One night while he's sleeping, three beautiful but uh, foul-breathed women come into the room. He attempts to pretend he's asleep, uh, but they set upon him with their red lips and their sharp teeth. And just when they are about to have their way with him, Dracula throws open the door and says, how dare you touch him, this man is mine. Jonathan faints and uh, well, that's that. Now, the, both of these situations, Jonathan's and Gawain's are transgressive on several levels. One is sort of the um, female domination aspect, which kind of borders, especially in Jonathan's case, on outright sexual assault. Um, the next, of course, I mentioned the homoeroticism, but the third is the specific idea of the woman sets you up and then the man comes to claim what is his. It's this combination of Eros and Thanatos, which would be uh, sort of read to readers as a little frightening, but also maybe 
maybe a little intriguing. Uh, Bertilac is not Count Dracula. However, he is more dangerous than Gawain realizes. When it uh, comes time for Gawain to have his appointment with the Green Knight, it turns out that the Green Knight was Bertilac all along. His wife was the Green Knight's wife. And they contrived the whole seduction uh, ploy as a test to see whether Gawain should be allowed to be left alive if he's honorable enough. Gawain did end up accepting a token from her, which he didn't give to Bertilac. So for that, he gets a little cut on the neck, actually kind of similar to Jonathan's bite on the neck, but he mostly passed. Um, and they tell him that's the important thing is that he's trying to be a better person. Uh, Gawain, as I've said, often seems to be the recipient of these kind of, uh, the, of these kind of encounters. But the Green Knight, I think, is the most gothic of his stories, both in terms of including this sort of monstrous uh, predatory figure. And also it all stems around, is Gawain going to break his honor? Is he going to be tempted? And what awaits him in the doomed place where he's threatened with death? Finally, of course, I'd like to talk about King Arthur himself. Now, Arthur does not traditionally have any magical powers of his own. Uh, those fall to either Merlin or one of the ladies of the lake. What he does regularly have that falls into the Gothic tradition are prophetic dreams. After he slept with Morgaus and fathered Mordred, he has a dream of monsters attacking. When he awakes, he meets a flesh and blood monster, the questing beast. And the man pursuing the questing beast, King Pellinor, who tells him that this beast was the product of incestuous lust between a sister and a brother. Arthur puts the symbolism together and realizes what he's done, but of course it's too late. Another prophetic dream he has in what I believe is a work called the Alliterative Mortartur, different than Mallory's. Um, he dreams of a dragon that defeats a bear in the fight. His advisors tell him that, of course, he is the dragon, as his father was Uther Pendragon, and the bear is some king he is going to defeat in battle. They are wrong. The dragon is Mordred, who is also of the blood of Uther Pendragon, and the bear is Arthur, whose name more or less means bear. Mallory gives him a third uh, prophetic dream. He's on the verge of battle, and Gawain, who is dead at this point, comes to him in a dream and tells him, don't fight, you will die. Arthur the, the attempts to actually take this advice and he and Mordred negotiate a truce. However, it's all for naught. A soldier sees a snake on the ground and pulls a weapon to kill it. All the other soldiers on both sides assume the fight has begun and it happens. None of these dreams actually really help Arthur very much. They usually come either too late or too cryptic but they are there to remind him of what he doesn't want to know. They are there to haunt him throughout his reign with visions of what he has done wrong and what is beyond his control. Now, chivalric literature was more than just King Arthur stories. There were also whole cycles involving the Knights of Charlemagne, including the famous Orlando slash Roland stories, which include um, Orlando Inamorato and Orlando Furioso. Robert Browning would eventually write a poem inspired by these stories called Child Roland to the Dark Tower Went, a Gothic work uh, where he, um, where Roland travels through this hellish landscape to reach the Dark Tower. And when he gets there, Browning refuses to tell what he found within it. Some of you will recognize this as the plot of Stephen King's The Dark Tower featuring a gunslinger named Roland uh, questing a poet across the post-apocalyptic wasteland for his own dark tower. Then there came Miguel de Cervantes and he wrote a parody of these stories called Don Quixote about a old man who reads too much uh, chivalric literature and decides he's gonna bring back the old days and be a knight. He is often portrayed in pop culture as sort of a noble striver despite his impossible dream. That is not how he is in the book. He is sympathetic and he does have good intentions, but he frequently has like complete hallucinations and is constantly injuring both himself and others in uh, the process. And at the end gives the moral that uh, you shouldn't read too many chivalric literary stories. Now this is connected to the Gothic via a work of Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey 
its heroine, Catherine Morland, is not crazy or even all that foolish as Don Quixote is, but she does read too many Gothic novels and gets to the point where she starts to suspect she sees Gothic plots lurking every which way and very nearly ruins her own romantic happiness like that. Um, what I think both of these works together show is that chivalric literature and Gothic literature were considered kind of the same in their respective eras. They are these entertaining, fantastical stories, but they can give people the wrong ideas. They're a little bit dangerous in terms of encouraging these flights of fantasy. Interestingly, though, instead of uh, completely condemning the Gothic work, Jane Austen ends the book with a humorous non-moral, where she says it is up to the reader to decide if the lesson is that parents should be more tyrannical or that children should be disobedient. Uh, let's see. Now, the, uh, here is where I think the real connection between the Arthurian literature and Gothic literature comes. The past is Gothic. Uh, uh, works of the original cycle of King Arthur stories were always set at least five or so hundred years ago. This is partly because obviously no one in living memory remembered it, but also because we always think of a lost land of lords and ladies and glorious towers and fine nobility as being somewhere in the past. And that's funny because uh, it keeps being moved, um, you know, to us, Mort d'Artour and uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth, that's the era of lost lords and ladies, but no, to them it was much earlier. Likewise, in the first wave of Gothic novels like The Castle of Otranto, which claimed to be a lost medieval manuscript, or Vathek, which claimed to be a lost ancient Arabic manuscript, it's in the past. And why? And uh, today also, today, uh, Gothic movies and TV shows often take place in the Victorian era because that has moved up to be our past. And that's because the past is both glamorous and barbaric. Anything can happen there. The Castle of Otranto, could a giant helmet have fallen from the sky and crushed a false prince? Why not? Anything could have happened. Dracula, could uh, either Vlad the Impaler or one of his descendants attend have attended a school run by the devil and then become a vampire? There were lots of weird warlords in the ancient days, why not? King Arthur, could a great hero have arisen to drive back the Saxons with the help of magic? Well, someone had to do it, and if magic existed, that would be the perfect time for it. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, of course, uh, loved his pseudo-medieval uh, settings, as in The Mask of the Red Death and Hop Frog. The story of Hop Frog is especially interesting because it includes it's about the revenge of a dwarf jester on his tormentors at court. And the reason this is interesting is because in uh, Mort d'Artour, there are frequently uh, dwarf henchmen and they're treated pretty horribly, including by uh, sometimes the supposed heroes and heroines. And Mallory didn't consider how the dwarf henchmen might have felt about this, but very clearly Poe did and thought he might be murderously angry. Now, uh, as I said, uh, there were publications of Mort d'Artour in 1816 and then another edition in 1817. But the Victorian craze for the Gothic really seems to have kicked off with, uh, or Victorian craze for Arthuriana seems to have really kicked off with Tennyson's Idols of the King. And this was a series of poems about Arthur and his knights. Um, they are very black and white. They're not the morally gray stories of earlier eras. Arthur is just the best person in the world. Guinevere is a horrible shrewish harlot who hates him because he is so good. This, uh, this is not necessarily a criticism. I think sentimental literature has as much place in the Arthurian canon as dark and gritty stuff. Um, but it did have a political reason, which is at the end of the book, there contains a direct address to Victoria comparing the late Prince Albert to Arthur and telling her that she needs to get out of mourning and uh, rule her kingdom the way Arthur would have. It also the king was very influential. It is not, however, all that goth. But there would be an Arthurian work in the 19th century that was surprisingly gothic and it was by the last person you would suspect. Mark Twain and his Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. This story starts as a comedy about a man uh, suddenly, inexplicably uh, transported to the time and place of King Arthur's realm. He attempts to start the Industrial Revolution. He attempts to spread literacy and social progress. 
it works for a while and then uh, probably because of one of Mark Twain's episodes of depression, it all goes to hell and ends in a horrible, violent bloodbath. But that's not the part that I want to talk about. The part that I want to talk about is earlier, he's sent on a stupid quest to get experience. And he and his companion, Alessande, stay at the castle of Morgan Le Fay. And he's heard that she's a witch, but she's in person very charming and very friendly and very beautiful. And he decides that this must have all been slander by her enemies. And then a young page boy serving wine trips and falls against her. And she takes out a dagger and she stabs him. The servants, looking terrified and afraid to meet her gaze, remove him, and she keeps talking just as pleasantly as she did before. Of course, our kinetic Yankee is horrified, and then when she shows him her dungeons, full of people being horrifyingly tortured for basically no reason, or for rebelling against her, again, he's horrified, and he, try, he orders her to let these people go, and she has to obey him, but he tries desperately to explain to her why what she does was wrong. And he talks about the page boy, there was no need to kill him. And <clears throat> she gets offended and says, how is that a crime? I paid for him, meaning that she's gonna pay for his funeral and pay what would have been his wages to his family. And uh, the Connecticut Yankee, Hank Morgan thinks, confound her, her intellect was good. She had brains enough, but her training made her an ass. That is from the many centuries later point of view. To kill the page was no crime, it was her right. And upon her right, she stood serenely and unconscious of offense. She was a result of generations of training and the unexamined and unassailed belief that the law which permitted her to kill a subject when she chose was a perfectly right and righteous one. Now, the reader who remembers that Mark Twain also wrote both Puddinghead Wilson and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn might start to suspect that Mark Twain is not talking about the feudal system here. And that's where I get into probably my spiciest hot take which is this is Southern Gothic. She is not an evil queen. She is a Southern belle and she is beautiful and she is charming and she wears just the prettiest clothes. And she's such a sweet old fashioned lady and such a good conversationalist. And she can kill one of her servants or one of her serfs and not bat an eye because they're not her. What does that matter? And she can have cages full of people she's torturing famously like, uh, Delphine LaLaurie did it in real life uh, to the point where even New Orleans slave owning society was horrified. And she just thinks nothing of it. And although again, the story ends as a huge bloodbath, these sections in Morgan Le Fay's castle are what continue to haunt me. Now, one of the big things about Camelot and stories about Arthur, they do always end in this bloody battle. Uh, Disney's Sword in the Stone was only able to have a happy ending because it ends immediately after Arthur is crowned. Um, and that in itself is very Gothic. The Gothic is about this decaying finery. These old castles, think of uh, Castle Dracula where there's cobwebs on everything and, and the old count doesn't even have any servants. He has to serve the meals himself, is, this hasn't been entered in God knows how long. Um, all the fallen dynasties, again, of the castle of Otranto, all the ruined abbey of Northanger that makes Catherine Moreland think something devious must be going on in here. That's what happens to Camelot. And it happens because of family betrayal. It happens because of sexual lust. It happens because you can never really trust those magicians with everything. And it happens because people tried to be good. They tried to do a good thing, but they just couldn't sustain it forever. Evil doesn't necessarily triumph, but good doesn't really triumph either. And I think that's what keeps us coming back to King Arthur stories is, are the Gothic elements. The fact that, again, the past, which is both glamorous and exotic and also barbaric and savage, this combination is what keeps us fascinated. This is an era, I, these are stories of beautiful and great deeds. And this is also, these are also stories of horrific events and uh, savage villains. And I think, you know, when they say that King Arthur will return, obviously some writers meant that literally, but I think uh, as Steinbeck would have put it, Arthur keeps coming back because we keep having more to say about this combination. It doesn't hurt also that there's a huge cast so you can make basically anyone uh, your protagonist, but 
this mix of of glory, of decay, of suffering, of greatness. What uh, they say in the musical is uh, a fleeting glimpse, glimpse of glory called Camelot. And that's what the King Arthur stories are in the end. I don't think I really have time to talk about it. I am gonna put on screen. Um, these are some works of Gothic Arthuriana that are contemporary works. If you're look, looking to uh, look into any, these are contemporary works of fiction about uh, King Arthur stories and um, they have Gothic elements. Not all of them are of uh, my personal taste, but I think they're all important in the genre. And I guess that's my talk. <laughs>